Colleagues, uh, welcome to uh, this evening, uh, presented by the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia here in the, uh, the National Gallery. Um, the theme, as you would be aware, is Can Good Policy Rescue Politics? Uh, I'm Glenn Withers, the uh, President of the Academy of Social Sciences, so let me welcome you all to this evening, now that you know that you're in the right lecture theatre, uh, <laughs> and don't have to change for a different person. Um, it's also this evening, though, a, uh, uh, one of our uh, series uh, which we term the Peter Carmel Forum on Public Policy. Um, this is very appropriate as uh, an auspice for uh, this evening's discussions, and I'll introduce the, the panel shortly, though of course you do know who they are. But uh, Peter Carmel, as a, a figure uh, oversighting what we're doing, is uh, absolutely uh, spot on for the sorts of purposes that we're addressing. He was a vice chancellor of uh, two universities, um, chancellor of another, and if you didn't know which the other was, it was the University of Papua New Guinea where he was a, a chancellor. Uh, head of numerous committees and reviews and councils, uh, including the Council of Education Research, and preeminently uh, president of the Academy of Social Sciences of Australia. So uh, that's um, a, a great precedent for our uh, focus this evening because he combined education, research, engagement uh, at, at absolute levels of excellence uh, in each. In, indeed, um, myself as an undergraduate at Monash, I can still remember to this day how much I enjoyed a book by Carmel and Brunt called The Structure of the Australian Economy, uh, and also another book by Carmel called uh, Statistics for Economists. <laughs> now, how many of you can remember your textbooks from your undergraduate days? I can hardly remember any others, but there too, I immediately remember. And it was because in amongst the sort of the hodgepodge of British and American texts, here were two lively, accessible Australian contexts, books that helped bring my subjects home to me in a way that the standard textbooks uh, didn't. And so I think that's an insight uh, as to how we should approach these things to incorporate our Australianisms uh, and ways of thinking into drawing on the best that we can from global uh, insights. Uh, I won't overdo the Australian analogies tonight. That's been uh, done enough, it seems, in the media today, which is one of the themes where going to be uh, talking about uh, Australia first and Australians first and, and all of that. Uh, it's appropriate though tonight, particularly that this is a Peter Carmel forum, uh, because it helps us celebrate uh, his life, but also the life of Lena Carmel, who passed away peacefully just recently on April the 8th. Uh, she reached the grand age of 94 and two granddaughters are here tonight to share the, uh, the evening uh, with us. So we're very grateful that they are uh, present with us uh, tonight. So this forum will honour that contribution from, from that family uh, in looking at these key issues of policy and politics. The forum itself uh, began in 2013 it's intended to provoke public discussion of particular policies of Australian government, the policy making process, comparisons of policies, uh, international comparisons of policies and processes, and uh, therefore this is a perfectly uh, appropriate set of issues for uh, pursuit this evening where we're going to look at Australia's uh, history of good policies and uh, bad policies for that matter built on uh, uh, the foundations that we used off sometimes well-researched evidence and sometimes not. But clearly in this uh, current environment, it's clear that evidence-based policy is uh, under some challenge and we want to look at that issue. Uh, it is accepted amongst uh, those who formalise policy in academic life that good policy should be based on careful analysis of the very best evidence uh, and we seek to uh, reduce the scope for populist short-term policy making, uh, though that invariably uh, comes to the fore in many decision-making processes. So uh, you're joining us to discuss how we can revive and uh, enhance good government. Can good policy making be an answer to the conflict between politics and policy? 
can the right policies be developed the right way and be an inspiration for strong and, uh, and visionary government that serves uh, the, the people best. Our panellists have been asked to speak on a variation of what steps are needed to make evidence-based policy more adopted, accepted and used. What are the major steps forward to enhance the role of evidence-based research in policy? What does good policy look like anyway? How is good policy adopted and what mechanisms of policies are needed uh, for future challenges? Uh, the evening is, of course, partly prompted by all the post-truth, uh, alternative fact, fake news themes of the day. Uh, I was just reading one of Michael Gove's speeches where he made the statement about, I think this country has had enough of experts, you might recall him saying in the Brexit uh, debate. Uh, and, of course, we've had the... President Trump phenomenon. Uh, there's a temptation, I think, to say, oh, if only we could go back to our old ways. As a, as a youth reading uh, Carmel and Brunt on structure of the Australian economy, I remember going into the Paran Library in Chapel Street, and there used to be a big section on one side called fiction, and a big section on the other side called non-fiction. And the world was in its place. I understood the difference. Uh, <laughs> and I could manage my way through that society and, uh, and those times. It's tempting to think that we've changed, but in fact, in part, that's an imagined past because uh, challenge uh, these sorts of issues of what is evidence, uh, how can it be convincing, how much can you get it incorporated in decision-making are, are long-standing issues. Indeed, there are uh, ironies even present in this era the Trump ascendancy and the, Brexit and the Brexit outcome were partly based upon fantastically good social science research by Cambridge Analytica, uh, Bannon's company. And it did quite pioneering and exciting interview research for, uh, pan uh, for panels and focus groups and, and opinion surveys that gave it insights that the standard research methods of the time had not revealed as readily to uh, other political parties. Uh, of course, you may be aware of co that, that Cambridge Analytica is now close to being on our shores for uh, our next election as an advisor to the coalition. Uh, so social science will play its role, uh, it seems, in uh, forthcoming political activities in Australia. But uh, I was even watching the Melbourne Comedy Festival on television last night and heard somebody saying, uh, that indeed what I'm saying right now is quite true. Fake news has always been with us. Look at the Bible. <laughs> now, that was their statement, not mine. Uh, <laughs> the Academy of Social Sciences is neutral on these sorts of matters. <laughs> now, let me uh, hand over, though, quickly to our, our panel who will take you through this uh, from their different uh, appropriately complementary perspectives. Uh, they are people who need really no introduction. Uh, and uh, let, let me at least go in, they're currently in alphabetical order, but let me at least go in, in reverse alphabetical order because as a withers, I often want to do this. It's, it's sort of <laughs> standing in the, in the milk queue at, at Hawksburn State School in Melbourne and getting the hot milk or no milk has, has made me very sensitive to these, these sorts of issues. Uh, so let me start with Catherine Murphy. Uh, and I will introduce all of our panel right now just to remind you. Uh, and Catherine, of course, is a leading figure from the National Press Gallery, uh, political affairs editor of the Australian Guardian, and uh, a well-known uh, media uh, figure who knows that media inside and out from work for the ABC, the Financial Review, uh, the, the Age, uh, and the Australian. So uh, quite a diversity of experience there that we want to draw on tonight. John Houston is known to people well too. Great experience at top levels of each of uh, academic life, business, and government. Uh, in each case fighting a good fight uh, and not unknown to the media as well uh, in uh, us being able to access him tonight. He was uh, on the radio this morning talking about our evening, uh, as was Meredith Edwards, who was in the Canberra Times uh, on, uh, on page four. But as, as we build up our capacities uh, in this area, in, in a, a newly engaging and communicating Academy of Social Sciences of Australia, Meredith will be on page one before long, we can assure you, <laughs> because she's a distinguished practitioner of the arts and sciences of public service and university uh, leadership. So we've got a wonderful combination of media experience, uh, politics experience, business experience, public administration and academic 
experience uh, for the night. So for my part, I'm pleased as president of the Academy uh, to chair this meeting. Um, and uh, in doing that, ASA is following, uh, is avoiding following what used to be the rule, which is Cornford's law. F.M. Cornford was the translator of Plato, uh, the, the principal translator. Uh, in a book called Academica Cosmographica, though, he said the rules of academic life, the following, and rule one was, vulgar fame shall not enter the halls of academe. That's changed. That at least has changed. And we know that in this era of impact and engagement, uh, what we're doing tonight is the right thing to do, both in terms of the emerging incentives, but also, I would argue, intrinsically. And so it's a delight to be uh, uh, involved in this evening. And I hope you find the, the evening's uh, engagement with our, our uh, eminent practitioners of many arts uh, uh, an insight for us tonight. We'll start off. Um, with alphabetical order, though, in the order we are here. So if uh, Meredith could uh, begin the discussion, we've got about 10 to 15 minutes from <coughs> each of the panelists. Then there might be a few questions from the, the chair, depending on the timing, and then open it up to the floor. And then there's uh, time for people to have informal discussion after we finish the formal proceedings. So much too much waffle from me. Let me hand over, please, to Meredith Edwards. Thank you. From here. You'd like to do it from there? Sure. Hi everybody, I know I'm in an audience of a lot of experts um, and I think experts are part of the elite, aren't they? Mm -hmm. In some people's language. So many of you who here would identify with that um, characterisation of you. But there are experts here from the public sector, experts from academia and uh, other sectors. So um, welcome and I look forward to your questions of us uh, at the end, and some of the um, maybe uh, um, challenges that you might put to us, given what we've said. I'm not sure whether I should speak as a public servant or as an academic, but I think given the panel, I'll talk as, as a public servant, even that was some years ago. When I was a public servant, I used to be called a bit of an egghead, um, because I had a sort of an academic leaning to me. And when I was an academic, I was called a bit of a bureaucrat because I like to get things done fairly efficiently. So I never quite knew where I was, but tonight I'll be, uh, uh, I'll be a public servant in, in a sense, uh, if not uh, a current one, one that, who observes what's happening in the, in, the, in the public sector. Our question is, can good uh, policy rescue good politics? And my answer to that is a yes, with some, I think, important qualifications. One of the things I think that is worth saying up front, which I learned as a public servant, probably the most important lesson I learned, was the importance of process um, as much as the policies themselves. I was so keen to get results. I was a bull at the gate for results, but I did learn it's how you did it, how you got there that, that really counted. So good process is vital to get um, good policy development and achieving desired outcomes. Now, you can't guarantee that will be the case, but what you can say is that the risks of bad process leading to bad outcomes are greater. I think, though, that we've reached a stage where public servants, if they haven't already, need to rethink um, how to influence policy decisions, and I say that for many reasons. Um, and I think, just to, to set the scene, I've always believed in, this is the academic coming through in me, I guess, an, an organising framework when you think about, the policy, about policies and, the, and, the, and policy processes. And that is looking at stages in the way in which policy gets developed. Not necessarily in a linear way, going from the problem to the data and evidence and its analysis to options to consultation, implementation, and uh, evaluation. That's how we normally characterise a, a policy cycle. Lots of people, especially academics, have criticised that. And I've, I'm up front, I'll say that is not linear. You don't do it necessarily in that order. It's like a policy dance. It's like snakes and ladders. But if you don't go through all those stages, at least with complex policy, you're unlikely to get to where you want to go. But 
th so that's the, that's the framework I wanted to use, and I, I believe, therefore, that all those stages are necessary. But it's different today. I think our emphasis is different for various reasons. Take, for one, the level of trust by the public in, in, the, in, the, uh, in public officials, particularly politicians, and, the par and their party processes. That creates more of a challenge than we ha would have had in the past and the shorter time spans that people are used to in developing policy. So if you think about that, when we talk about how are we going to find the problem, what's the problem here, what's the policy problem? And um, In the old days, we would have said, well, here's the problem. Well, we, we public servants are quite good at working out what a problem is, and then we'll get the politicians to articulate it, and then away we go, and we can, we can move to the next steps in the, in, in, the policy, in, in the stages of developing policy. Of course, until you've got people recognising the problem, you won't go very far. But today, what is the problem? Often in the Indigenous space or with homelessness or in many other areas, what is the problem? Who's defining it? Who's being asked to define it? And it may mean that we've got to consult quite widely, even just to, to define and articulate clearly how people perceive a problem to be. Um, so, that's, so, so I think we have to do be more inclusive, sometimes right from the start of the policy process uh, when we're talking, uh, when, we, when we're starting to define the process and then from that point on. Similarly, when we get to the evidence and the data, uh, we may need uh, there to um, take into account more than we did in the past, that evidence, it's not evidence-based policy, it never has been, but the influence of evidence on the, pol on the policy decisions could well be less now, and that we, as policy, as policy advisors and for the decision makers, need to take into account more some of the values, the deeply held values in society. And if we don't do that, well, then we may well come up with some sort of technocratic economic solution to a problem that's not taking into account all the other factors that, that obviously the politicians are going to have to consider. That doesn't mean that that public servants have to be overly responsive to the political message of the day. I don't mean that at all. But I do mean that there has to be some understanding and empathy of the values that are out there that are often very conflicting in, the, in, in that, that, that form some of the policy, the policy advice. And where there are differences, working out ways of getting people with different perspectives into some sort of dialogue. The stage of, we used to call it a formal consultation stage in the policy process, you know, you'd, you'd do all your hard work and then you go out and consult and then you close down and come back and develop the policy in, in, in the, you know, the safe, uh, safe rooms of, of, of government. Now, these days, the more difficult the problem, the more the process needs to be inclusive from the start to the end. And just having a formal, a formal consultation process might work fine for some issues. That doesn't mean you're not engaging with relevant stakeholders throughout the process of developing policy. It might work, for example, on housing affordability. It might have been a good idea to have some sort of discussion paper some months ago so we could all get informed about the different options with all of the options on the table and then government coming in, narrowing down and producing some sort of uh, uh, package of measures in the budget. Now, that's what we used to do, and I don't think we're doing enough of that now, except the Productivity Commission's doing it. Uh, and well, why are we leaving it only to them? Why isn't there more of that taking place within, within the public service proper? Um, so, that's, so uh, um, but, but there are other cases, like if you take some of the really intractable, some people call them wicked problems in the Indigenous space, we don't know what the problem is until the community is involved and certain uh, processes are taking place, testing, experimenting, learning from what we, we know before we can move forward. So it may be that you've got to go back, forwards, and um, engage, the, engage communities, as I learned when I did do some research on closing the gap. One of the most common factors that we could see that wasn't taking place was engaging uh, the local communities in helping to solve their own problems with government, not government imposing them on, on, on Indigenous communities. Another factor here is the more, in fact, the, the 
complex the problem or, and or lack of political leadership, the more we may need to build alliances, the business community with academics, with unions and so on. And I remember um, in some notes that uh, Nicola Roxon uh, produced, she was saying with the tobacco, plain packaging tobacco, that one of the main parts of that process was an alliance building amongst relevant sectors in the, in the community that supported what the politicians wanted to do. She put that down as one of the major lessons that she'd learned from, from, that she was imparting to uh, health experts at the time from her, from her uh, tobacco plain packaging, packaging experience. And I think what we are now, and I know the Department of Social Security is involved in this, we might hear more about it, in more experimentation with what is working. There is something over there called, I think it's called um, uh, Try, Test and Learn, taking on some initiatives, say, with the long-term unemployed or young carers, and working out what will work for them to get them into a more sustainable employment path into, into the longer term. This is experimenting in a small scale so that you can, you can uh, make, you know, go for larger, uh, larger changes later on, but learning as you go, uh, co-designing with relevant stakeholders as you go, and then coming back and saying, well, here's what we've learnt, this is what's failing, let's fail quickly and move on and then and try another path. Some, there's some literature, ac academic literature on this called uh, experimentalist governance, actually, which I'm quite keen on and I won't go into its details here, but this is all about um, co-designing with relevant stakeholders the, the policy and implementing and learning as you go and not, and, and not just waiting for three years and having some sort of evaluation. Evaluation is something we've dropped the ball on and we do need to do more of it, but I'm talking here about a process of learning, monitoring as, as well as uh, evaluation. So they're the stages in the policy cycle which I think we need to revisit in the light of uh, current circumstances. But for the public service, and I'll finish on this note, to be more effective, I think there's got to be some action on the demand side, that is for good policy. We need to see, in my view, a strong view of minor change in the balance of power between ministerial advisers and, and public servants. So we don't have this um, risk averse way of operating that often you find with public servants, the ones I teach anyway, uh, and, a, and a clarification of the respective roles of public servant and political advisor, which are quite distinct. But there can still be a partnership, a good partnership in developing policy. Um, we need to revisit the role of um, the extent to which we, we rely on consultants for policy advice. And, and see what it has done adversely to the policy capability of the public service and how that can be remedied. And above all, as I'm sure we'll hear more about, we need more political leadership. And some, I'd say, authenticity. I'd say there's an authenticity deficit in, um, in, in what we're hearing from our politicians. So I think that's a good note to stop. Good timing. Thank you very much, Meredith. And uh, maybe we should give her a little applause to, to help... <laughs> Keep people engaged, it's like standing up during a, a talk and so on. A bit of applause is a contribution. And uh, John Hewson will now make his contribution, please, John. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, you mentioned two of the Carmel books. I have both of them at home. Um, I also have a third book called How to Lie with Statistics. Oh, yes. ah. <laughs> and I'm thinking with the sort of the post-truth um, fake news world, I probably should dust that one off mm -hmm. and have another look at it. Um, I can speak a bit from my own personal experience of getting involved in policy in the middle 70s, coming as a comment from the Reserve Bank, having spent many years in the IMF developing international policy and starting global economic forecasting and so on. And um, when I went to finally succumb to the persuasion of Philip Lynch to be his economic advisor, so I initially turned him down, I said, I didn't want to spend nine years doing four university degrees to waste it on a bloody politician. <laughs> uh, but he said, well, if you want to have influence, you have to work out of my office because you'll get direct access to Cabinet. And you've been writing these papers in the Reserve Bank, nobody's ever heard of them. They go into Treasury and they sink without a trace. I know you want to manage the exchange rate, why don't you write me a one-page, Phil, if we had one, everything was on one page. Um, one page Cabinet submissions to how we might do that and put it through the Cabinet and they took that decision. 
So I reluctantly accepted the invitation. But I came, did so in the expectation that good pu public policy, good evidence-based public policy, would be good politics with a relatively short lag. And that was my main motivating force. I was great one at pulling together evidence and opinion and consultation in the development of policies and, um, and uh, then trying to get them implemented. And I carried that through my time in politics, delivered the fight back package in the early 90s, lost an election, having produced thousands of pages of policy detail only to be told that it was the longest political suicide note in history. <laughs> because I'd misunderstood the significance of the trend that was happening away from evidence-based policy and the politicisation of the process. I never forget on the first day back in Parliament after the 93 election, where you moved from the lower house to the upper house, getting, uh, took me aside as we made that transition one after the other, behind a column, and he said, I want to speak to you privately. And I thought, OK, fine. <laughs> the first time I'd seen him after the 93 election, he asked me how I was. I said, I'm fine. He said, oh, you must feel terrible. You lost. It's OK if I stick around, um, which I didn't expect to, but if I did, I'll beat you next time because you lied to get there and, you, you know. He said, no, I want to apologise. He said, I called you some terrible things and uh, I don't mean any of them. I only respect you and I could have lost to you. He said, but you've got to understand one thing, and I had never understood this until he said it, that politics to me, John, is just a game and I'll say I'll do whatever I have to to win. And here's me thinking, well, I, you know, I just lost the election. Well, I never imagined it was a game. You know, I imagine it was a, a serious contest in ideas and, and, and alternative policies and indeed as leader of the opposition I tried to make it easy for government. Instead of just opposing, okay, if I disagreed we'd oppose, but it, was, it seemed to me to make sense to try and get out in front, set the agenda, try and make it possible for them to, to bring on good government. You know, so I'd argue for lower tariff protection, in fact Keating called me Captain Zero because I was happy to go to zero tariff protection, but made it easy for him to cut you know, protection and clothing and footwear from 400% to, you know, 25% uh, without any sort of backlash. And the same with all the financial sector reforms, a whole lot of other changes, commitment to the first Gulf War and so on. We just went out in front. Um, today, of course, the game has become the end in itself. And politics has become a game. And it's a very short-term, opportunistic, populist, mostly negative, sometimes very personal game which uh, doesn't really create an environment in which you're going to get serious policy development or debate at all. Indeed, I would say today that short-term politics is the main constraint on the development of good policy and the implementation of good policy. And the whole layers of that process, which uh, Meredith has, has partially explained, involving the bureaucracy and consultation beyond uh, ministerial advisors versus bureaucrats um, and various vested interest groups, uh, the media, uh, and so on. That's a very politicised process now, incredibly politicised. And everyone's playing their part in the political game. So the difficulty is that to have a serious policy debate on a difficult issue, and some of these issues are not going to be solved overnight. You mentioned housing affordability. I mean, it's a complex issue. It's been the result of a couple of decades of drift. We used to point this out as a potential crisis in the 80s. I mean, here it is today as a crisis. Um, it's got layers between the state and federal government. Uh, you're not going to turn it around straight away. There's no instantaneous silver bullet solution. It's a complicated issue that needs to be carefully assessed and debated. And there's a fair bit of analysis around on it that you could draw to the debate, but it doesn't get much currency. Somebody proposes doing something on the demand side, let's you know, restrict negative gearing and... Uh, and capital gains tax concessions to reduce the investor demand, the incentive for investor demand. The other side said, no, no way, and that's it. We'll move on to another subject another day. And uh, yet expectations are being raised that they are going to solve this problem. You know, uh, Morrison tells us it's going to be the centrepiece of this year's budget. Uh, Berejiklian in New South Wales just been elected on the platform that it's the first issue that we're going to deal with. And quite frankly, they don't have the capacity individually to do much about it at all. It's going to take a holistic, overarching, detailed approach over a number of years to actually change the circumstances that have been created by a couple of decades of drift. And uh, when I see the budget task, the budget repair task, another example of drift. You know, I go back, I was just looking at numbers today, 2009, 2010 budget. We were going to have a surplus in 18 months. And as you go through each of the budgets under whoever's been there, 
the expectations are raised, the outcome is assumed, <laughs> and, the, and uh, of course we never quite get there. We're always falling short and the problem's probably worse than it was 2009, 2010. So, you know, it's drift as a result of this very short-term opportunistic game. And the question to me this evening is how do you turn that around? I mean, there's a wealth of evidence there in many of these cases to draw on. I mean, I think of the tax reform debate, which I'm pretty active in. That's been a, we've had more inquiries and overviews and analyses of the tax issue. There's, plenty, there's a voluminous material to draw on. We actually know what to do. <laughs> it's just having the political courage and will and capacity to do it and to lead the debate, to carry that through the parliament. Uh, to carry it first with the community, I think, then into the parliament and then obviously fully implemented. So the tragedy I think we've ended up with is that we, we need a number of things to fix the, the process. Uh, Meredith sort of picked up, I think, on three essential phases of policy development, maybe more. But to me, the first one is getting community assess uh, acceptance of the magnitude of the task, the urgency and the magnitude of the task. The second thing is a willingness to lay out the options and, 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 to, and stimulate public debate about options. And the third one is then for the government, the opposition, whoever, to identify which policy package it will usually be that they want to implement and then, and then to go out and argue that case. Not just sort of mention it one day and drop it the next, put it on the table one day, take it off the next. This is just a totally counterproductive process. And to get people to accept the urgency of the problem and the magnitude the problem can be quite significantly difficult. But in some cases, the community is way ahead of the government. I would use climate change as an example of that. I think the community, for instance, since pre-Rudd, has been way in front of governments wanting reaction, wanting substantive responses. Would wear slightly higher electricity prices, they say in surveys, to get the sort of transition that we need to make. Yet what do we get? We get sh almost incessant short-term politicking today, one side says, well, we should have a renewable energy target for 2030, and the other side says, no way. You know, have you any idea what that's going to do to electricity prices? In the meantime, electricity prices go up, gas prices go up because of drift, because of neglect, because of a failure to actually address the issue. So I think, um, to me, the elements are obviously consultations fundamental in each of the three stages that I mentioned. But leadership, it comes down to somebody being prepared to stand up and lead, to be prepared to, you know argue a case for significant change and to lay it out, take the community to that point of accepting the magnitude and early urgency of the challenge, then going through you know, the options as to what should be done or could be done, and then being prepared to argue a case and go to right through the process with that sort of argument. Now, I don't see that happening, and I don't see it easily happening. Uh, I'll use one current example. Turnbull came in with enormous expectations. Oh, we've finally got rid of Abbott, a huge national sigh of relief. Turnbull's going to be, I mean, he stands for climate change, he stands for tax reform, he stands for gay marriage, whatever, you know. And actually, he didn't stand for any of those things. Because in the end, he didn't deliver against any of those expectations. So he's had the fastest and most significant fall in personal poll standing of any leader. Yet I still think, I would say, that if he were prepared to lead on a few key issues, get out in front, set the agenda take the community with him, uh, argue the case, the electorate would cut him a lot of slack. But unfortunately, he's becoming more sort of Malcolm Trump than he is Malcolm Turnbull. Because you see that yesterday with the 457 visa, that was a very, very popular, populist, I should say, response to what is a serious issue. Not a very big issue, because we've got less than 1% of the workforce that are on their 457 visas, but it's a significant issue, and it was an area of abuse. But you could fix it in a way that satisfied people or you could, you could um, you know, make it look that you were doing more than you were doing. So I think the bottom line is that they're looking for leadership. They will cut that sort of leadership a lot of slack and I think it would make a very big difference to the policy debate because once we got back to re reasonable discussion about ideas and concepts and alternatives, I think the, uh, the electorate would... would be much more enthusiastic about government. Otherwise, we're going to just see more and more of this anti-establishment, anti-institution, you know, anti-government sort of drift that you've seen with Brexit or you're seeing now in a number of European elections. You've seen it with Trump, you've seen it with Hanson, and that's not the sort of world I think we should want to uh, be creating for the future. Thank you.
Good. Thank you, John. We're going to move on to Catherine, but let me mention along the way, some of you might like to look at a report that the Academy of Social Sciences uh, oversighted that's on the Australian Council of Learned Academies website. Uh, ACOLA is the acronym. It's a report on Australia's comparative advantage, but in that you'll find some uh, survey results of public opinion amongst many other studies. It includes behind it the, the commission study that looked at public opinion. And one of the sorts of issues that was looked at was, gee, if people are so educated, why are we in such trouble, given that we've improved the education in the community hugely and you'd expect a better political outcome? What was really interesting was that the, the public was, A, willing to understand the problems, did understand a heck of a lot of the problems, but really felt it was lacking through our major institutions, the leadership to bring those problems to appropriate discussion and decision. And so this issue of that vacuum of leadership, uh, not just in government, but also in a range of institutions, was uh, clearly accepted by the public. Uh, dare I say, the evidence shows that. Uh, so it's a, an important theme, I think, that John's raised. And there really is a latent desire to be better. And maybe Catherine will take us further through this maze now, please. <laughs> I'm not sure the desire's that latent, Gwen. <laughs> I think the desire's okay. very overt. Um, well, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out. It's really lovely to be in this venue and to see all of you here to have such a serious discussion, which we've got, of course, no prospect of being able to land in such a short time. Uh, but we've got two really interesting contributions that I just want to bounce off quickly before making some general observations, just with some thoughts before I forget them. Uh, Meredith made the point about, uh, about uh, clarifying the role between public servants and ministerial advisers uh, to basically sort of create, um, well, I suppose, a more fruitful policy development process rather than being at loggerheads. I think it's sort of the major thing I think that we can point to because if we sort of think about when did things start to sort of feel as though they were sliding off the rails, if we sort of try and create some sort of origin story about where we think things started to slide off the rails. For me, uh, things in political life st sped up enormously sort of in the final year when John Howard was the Prime Minister and in the transition to Kevin Rudd and his first year of being Prime Minister. So it's sort of around 2007 where things really started to accelerate dramatically in political life. And I think part of the sort of gap between um, public service policy making and ministerial staff at the present time is not so much that we're all kind of addicted to this hopelessly adversarial kind of system, although we kind of are, but I think there's a speed dimension to it as well. Uh, I've talked recently just for a piece that I'm doing uh, to some staff who sort of went from that transition from when Labor was in opposition to Kevin Rudd's sort of first year in office in an attempt to try and understand their perspective. And one of them said something very interesting to me, that when Rudd came in, uh, well, well, sorry, before, when, when Rudd took the leadership from Kim Beasley, he set himself, uh, dare we say, a John Hewson-like objective of setting the agenda, basically, of, of, from opposition, that you would set the agenda from opposition. You wouldn't sit back as Kim Beasley did and react to what the government of the day did, you would actually define the agenda, which took an enormous amount of work, grunt work, in order to do that. When these guys washed up into government and they, they came after a long period of being in opposition, basically they arrived in the Prime Minister's office and Kevin Rudd thought he could work at the same speed that he could when in opposition, basically, when you... When you you're out there, you're doing policy work, you're setting the agenda at breakneck speed. He thought you could come into government and keep working at breakneck speed and somehow the bureaucracy would be there to help you and back you up. And that is not how the bureaucracy works. So the two sort of things were out of alignment from the beginning. And in that process, uh, a lot of the work was pulled into the Prime Minister's office the, because of Rudd's desire for speed. You know, we have to announce this today. We have to deliver this tomorrow. We have to do this thing. So 
I think for a little while in Canberra, speed has been this sort of gap between what political staff think they need in order to govern in a very, very contested and difficult environment and what public servants think you need to do in order to produce good evidence-based policy. And the two things have sort of been in conflict for quite a long period of time. How you bridge that, I really don't know, but I just wanted to pick up on that point because it's sort of, it's something that I have observed in my reporting lifetime. You know, we used to have more deliberative processes and now these processes are are shrunk uh, and, and, they're, and they're sort of tailored to fit a 24-hour news cycle rather than a 20-year or a 30-year policy development cycle. So that's, that's sort of the first point I wanted to pick up on. John's point about leadership too is right. Of course, you know, some days I really, my despair is just off the charts, sitting there in the middle of what appears to be an unhinged circus a lot of the time. You do look at it and you think, oh, my God, you know, because, because you're not an abstract observer, you're a participant. And most of us actually participate in the circus uh, to try and make the country a better place to the extent that we can in our relative roles. And you look at it and you think, oh, my God, this is just hopeless. But I think there's, it's, it's slightly more complex than uh, a leader standing up and saying, I will lead in the current environment, because we've sort of got to look at the sum of the parts of the last 10 years, which is where I've sort of, I'm centering my origin story. Over the last 10 years, we've seen in, in political parties a constant cycle of leadership instability in both of the major parties. We've seen that very, very heavily contested. And what's happened is now, oppositionism is not confined to basically uh, pulling down your opponent across the dispatch box every day. The oppositionism, the oppositionism has crept within party structures. And now we have this sort of lethal factionalism and lethal personality conflict. And we've seen this basic, we saw it cripple the Labor government. We saw a personality struggle in essence between Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard cripple the Labor government. And we've seen another cycle of it with this government. Basically, Abbott was the leader, uh, made a terrible mess of things, I think it's reasonable to say, was pulled down by Turnbull, who sailed forth thinking that he would have the authority of, of a definitive election result in order to sail forth into this term and do some stuff. And, of course, that didn't happen. And now we have this structural instability where uh, at least part of Turnbull's problem is internal stakeholder management. <laughs> Uh, let alone what the country needs or what, uh, you know, what a, what a sort of fruitful evidence-based policy process may deliver. It's it, internal stakeholder management has become a really big issue in politics. And, uh, and that's part of that cycle of leadership instability that we've seen over the last decade, that these things are all connected. It's not, I'm sure, that Malcolm Turnbull sits around thinking, how can I avoid being a decent leader? Uh, he's got a first principles problem. I need to keep my job. So I have internal constituencies I have to deal with. This is not an apologia, John, when you sigh at me and look, look at me. No. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, it's not, it's not an apologia in any shape or form. I'm just saying we have to look at the sum of the parts because it's the sum of the parts that's delivering the suboptimal outcomes. And we have to think about defining why that's happening rather than just sort of sitting back and thinking abstractly, oh my God, politics sucks. Like, really, I can't listen to another word of this crap. We actually have to look at what's going on and what's driving these cycles. So I think that's, that's, actually, a big, that's actually a big deal in our system at the moment. And I have no smart answers for how this cycle ends. Uh, I hope uh, that Labor's learnt the odd lesson from the, from the Rudd-Gillard Civil War period. Uh, one would hope that... Uh, the coalition could get its act together, but you know, Tony Abbott is hanging around like Banquo's ghost, and it's it's it seems it's it's just basically on this on this sort of rat wheel, and that that basically connects to the sort of policy development process that we're getting. Once the government breaks, it's really hard to put a government back together again, and a government can't function optimally, in my view, if there is if there is this lethal internal factionalism. And, and this distrust 
structural distrust between key players. So that's part of the issue. In terms of the foundation question, I'll wrap up, Glenn, very quickly. Um, can good policy res rescue politics? Well, yes, so I think it can. But I also think that we can sort of create some arbitrary distinctions sometimes between politics and, and, and policy. We sort of see policy as this kind of citadel, you know, this light on the hill, this sort of perfect, wonderful thing that is trammelled by evil, dreadful, suboptimal politics. And that's reasonable because, I mean, hello, look, look at the, you know, that's reasonable. But the two things are connected. Good policy doesn't go out and sell itself. Good policy doesn't just sort of uh, legislate its way through a parliament. Basically, politics is essential to the enterprise. It always has been, it always will be. The art of politics is basically synthesising conflict and, and trying to push policy forward. That's why we have democratic politics. It's sort of to you know, try and prevent us going out and punching one another in the street. It's, 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 putting, it's formalising a process of settling our arguments and resolving our big conversations. So... As much and all as politics just makes me want to seriously commit harikari a lot of the time, I think we have to believe in it, I think we have to invest in it, uh, and I think we have to see it as connected to the process of policy rather than viewing these two things as sort of abstract and, and separate. They are connected. You can't basically deliver policy reform without good, healthy, vibrant politics. Uh, so I think we sort of need to think about these things a bit more inclusively sometimes rather than setting up these binary constructs, which are not always helpful. Anyway. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Can I try and switch some conversation around and then open it up to the audience? But uh, I don't want us to finish on a Hari Kari note. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wonder if we could get each of the panellists, A, to make any comments they wanted to about the discussion to date, but especially to say, where are causes for optimism or hope? What are the, what are the, the bright lights we can see? Or if we have to create them again, or afresh or new, whichever it is, uh, what positive steps can we see that would contribute to better outcomes than, than we have been uh, worrying about right now on this panel tonight? So where are the positives? What can we look to, or what can we look to for change to advance better outcomes? So if, if anybody's got any of those ideas, I have lots. Uh, I'm, I'm much more a glass half full person in this area. Uh, and, and, and tapping this, what I called before mistakenly latent uh, concerns and desires of the public, I think there are, there are ways of doing this when you go through step by step. But could I get some guidance on this from the views of, of the panel, I guess in the same order as before that Meredith and... Well, I think I, I thought I had some positives in what I had to Can say. Can you repeat them, please? <laughs> I want to hear them again. Um, <laughs> in there are good things happening in the public service. There are spots where, you know, there's good practice. And, uh, and it's sort of not necessarily up there in lights. And I, t I take the Department of Social Security, it's got a rich and long, social services, rich and long history of good policy development, a good research and good policy development, as David Stanton, who's here, well knows. I worked with him in uh, social security a long time ago. And it's still there. And I mentioned the uh, try, test mm. and learn type experimentation. Now, OK, I'd like to see that bigger and better and across the public service in many, you know, could be much more, more could be made of it. But there are lessons that are going to be learnt from all of that. And they're trying to solve real problems with real people um, uh, in an in a evidence-based way. Mm. So, um, I, and, and, and I'm sure there are many more examples of that as well. I also think there's more capability in the public service than we give credit for. It's not used as well as it could be. I've always maintained that. We might have lost some of it because we've been using consultants and so on. But I still think we've got it. And I'd like, to, I'd like, I'd like us to, uh, to, to focus on that and try and gain more uh, of the resilience of our public servants who at the moment are dumbed down and risk averse and compliant orientated. But um, there's some good, there's good stuff there, there are great, great skills um, that I think um, in the right environment will come, will, 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 will foster, be fostered. Uh, the other thing is, I think, with some, there is a need for, um, in my view, a better relationship with researchers, and since we have many here, I might mention that. Researchers are there, but they don't always understand the context in which policy is being uh, developed, 
And that's where uh, public servants can help in dialogue. Uh, and, and dialogue is a very powerful, you know, workshops, roundtables, very powerful way of uh, academics hearing what, what, what's going on uh, in, in the policy and political world and for, for public servants to hear some lateral thinking that might come from, from academics and the depth of their research. The more we can get the cross-boundary um, um, uh, conversations going, I think the, um, uh, the better it's going to be. And why can't it start today? Good, thank you. John? Just to build on that, I mean, one of the good things I think that's uh, happening now at, at ANU is the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation which is um, actually funding a range of uh, PhD students from the public service, senior levels of the public service, and building that interconnection between the public service and academia, which has waned quite a lot, I think, over my lifetime. And giving, you know, getting people, top class people, potentially secretarial level people, I would think, um, with a good policy focus, uh, giving them the academic rigour around that to qualify for a PhD. And um, that's been a very satisfying part of what I've been doing the last couple of years, is just nurturing some of those, because that change will be very important, I think, in time. And it's always the old issues about how does somebody out of academia fit back in the public service and vice versa. But it's being managed actually surprisingly well with a combination of academic and public service mentors and, and so on. I think one thing that can be done, and most both sides of politics know what they can do to fix it, the issue of vested interest in this country has become a big issue. And the fact that so they can have an undue influence on particular policy outcomes annoys a lot of people. A lot of that comes from the way we allow politics to be funded and uh, the role of lobbying. Mm. And I think you can clean that up. Okay. You can clean up campaign funding. I mean, I, I've been over this issue many times in my life, but I would like to think you be, should be able to restrict campaign donations to individual donations to a limit. No business institution, research association, foreign, whatever mm -hmm. donations exactly. from anywhere. And if that's inadequate to fund our democracy properly, then unfortunately, I think we probably have to go to full public funding with better, better rules than mm -hmm. we've presently got. But that would allow you to start the process of cleaning up politics. I think... Uh, if you add to that uh, more transparent lobbying processes, and a number of governments are trying that, getting ministers to declare their diaries and, and you know, admit to meetings, and you know, I think that, that, that helps a lot. Um, and um, then, of course, politicians themselves can raise the standard of parliament quite seriously if they want to. Um, and I have my own views about that. I would I'd, uh, ban all Dorothy Dick's questions, all questions of the government, two-minute limits, no notes from ministers. Don't know the work shouldn't be there, um, you know. And, um, and and a genuinely independent speaker, perhaps from outside mm. Parliament. You change the nature of it, elevate the committee process more along a, perhaps the U.S. lines, get more substance, more continuity. There's a whole lot you could do to fix the public image of politics, within which then you could start, I think, a more successful debate about policy. That's sounding great, John. Fight back, O2. Oh, <laughs> 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 We're looking forward to the volume, Catherine. No, I totally agree on the on the transparency and funding points. I think that's actually essential, and and a political party with the guts to actually take that on, I think, would be rewarded by the public. They know um, what to do; they just won't do no, it. No, I know. It's it's yeah. quite it's it's sort of and and watching people act <laughs> against their own interests is yeah, a really strange terrible. live social experiment as well. But anyway, that's um, <laughs> that's life. Um, causes for optimism. Okay. Um, my main cause for optimism is that still the majority of politicians that I interact with are in politics for the right reasons. They may not always transmit that to the public, but I would say the overwhelming majority of politicians who I interact with are in public life for the right reasons. They, they may not be able to execute it particularly elegantly or beautifully at the present time, but they're there for the right reasons. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, because uh, that's the foundation from which anything else emerges. So I suppose that's cause for optimism. Um, I would love some way, because I think I said in my contribution that the kind of leadership instability is such a big problem and it's having such profound effects on our political process, 
at the moment. I wish that there was some w a way to end that cycle. Uh, and I also wish that there was more... Uh, and I think part of the leadership instability is part of the reason why we can't have considered bipartisanship on areas where we really need it, like on energy policy or on climate policy or housing. On, on housing affordability. It's sort of like the, the, the cycles of conflict are now so entrenched that, it's, that there, there is this sort of oppositionism, constant oppositionism. Uh, and I would love some magic bullet that, that someone in the political process could stand up and just say, nah, <laughs> enough, just enough. And by that, I don't mean that politicians have to agree on everything. I'm not, I'm not against conflict in politics. Conflict is the stuff of politics. But I mean on, on policy that matters, that there would be some means of declaring a peace. Uh, but how we do that, who is enlightened enough to do that, who has the internal authority to do that, uh, well, we haven't really seen that person in recent times. One more note of optimism is also that, uh, that good stuff does happen in politics still in my contemporary lifetime. I still, I remain amazed on, well, a mutual point of obsession between John and I about climate policy. I remain astonished that uh, a minority Labor government managed to legislate a carbon price mm. through two houses of parliament that he did not control. Like that really is, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it all went down in a screaming heap, uh, that really is an astonishing feat that happened in this country in recent political history, where just the right thing happened. And people came together and they got it done. Now the story didn't end well. I hope the story will end better. <laughs> Sorry, terrible grammar, but I hope things will improve. But you see what I mean? It's sort of like politics can continue to astonish you on the upside every now and again, mm -hmm. even if the story doesn't end well. So I'll hang on to that as my little note of optimism. Can I just comment on just Absolutely. one aspect of that? I mean, this internal party conflict is a difficult issue. It's one I inherited because when I became leader in 1990, we'd had the 10 years yes. of Howard versus Peacock. You had. Yeah. The only reason I stood was I didn't want to go through that again. Yeah. You know, to be honest, because it was so pointless and becoming incredibly sort of childish and, and personal. And, um, but I started with a very divided group of people. And the only way I could see that, I see that as a management issue. I mean, most management today is about managing people. So what do you do with people? So I elevated the policy task. I said that we needed to develop policies with a 10-year horizon where we could position Australia as a, in a leadership role in the Asia-Pacific region within 10 years, and I gave every single person a job in that process. Mm. And the ones I didn't get on very well with, I gave them defence jobs and foreign policy jobs. <laughs> and they could be in London or Geneva or wherever. <laughs> and they had, didn't have a lot of time on their hands to, um, to organise. And over time, we built an, a, a mechanism by which everyone felt part of the process. Mm. And you, it's, it's just a management issue to me. But and I'm not that... saying it's transferable today, but, you know, when we came to clear fight back through the party, all right, this is going to be a tough process, because yeah. it'll leak. I said, OK, I'll allocate two full days of debate, morning, noon and night, on the condition that nothing leaks. And we went through the process, two days of constructive debate and discussion, no leaks. And then a unanimous decision at the end to stand by that as a package. Now, now, I think move. you can manage that, but if you let it drift and you let people start to talk and score points, and which is what's been happening, you're never going to pull that back very easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's and I saw, I learnt that lesson in the Fraser years, where there was always a rump in the Fraser government. There was a group on the back bench that would tell me they'd rather be on the back bench in opposition than on the back bench in government because they'd have more influence and more power which I thought was insane. Mm. And so we had the dries versus the other. You know, look, it could be managed, and Fraser managed it. Mm. Well, let's move to the wider mm. constituency, though. We do yeah. have time to spill over a little before we serve drinks and so on. So could we take about five or six questions from the audience? And maybe the best way to do it is if we could have about five questions and then the panel can respond. So do we have some people that would like to put forward some comment or question? And we'll take it on notice and then have a response when we've had a group. Yes, down the front. research on public policy issues 
and making it widely available. So Australia Institute, the Grattan Institute, websites like Inside Story and The Conversation where people can actually get access to reasonably good analysis. Okay, so the role of think tanks, and can we add to that the role of consultancies too? Up the back, I think, was next. Yep. So, Catherine, I really enjoyed your uh, discussion and characterization of politics as a circus today. <laughs> I think that's brilliant, um, especially from my perspective in the public service. Uh, what I'd really like the panel to talk about, though, is the breakdown in the mechanisms of good governance. So I would take that origin story back to 1996 with the election of John Howard, the introduction of a new Public Service Act, mm -hmm. and sort of the, the ripping out of the carpet um, underneath secretaries and dep deputy secretaries yeah. in departments and removal of tenure. Yep. Um, and yep. after that, sort of the politicisation of departments. Um, so the dialectic between politicians on the hill, um, the political masters, and public servants themselves who feel that um, they, they must respond um, in a reactionary way to the uh, political desires of those masters. Good point. Thanks, everyone, for your insights tonight. Um, I'd like to ask, in light of all the populist anti-establishment sentiments that we are seeing around the place at the moment and in Australia too, what are some ways that the normal everyday person could be engaged better with politics, either from the perspective of the individual or from the political parties and the establishment that a lot of them rally against? Right. We're getting some good grist for our mill over here. And then... Um, I'd like to ask the question, or the panel to address the question of how you manage the social media aspect of politicians and politics at the moment, which um, John mentioned what he did um, some time back, but then Twitter wasn't around, Instagram wasn't around, WhatsApp wasn't around, all of those um, communication feeds weren't about that you have really a great deal of difficulty controlling. So I'd like some comment on how that influences policy and politics. And then a, a question here, we'll see how long it takes for response and see if we've got any more time. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm a uh, biological scientist. Uh, an ecologist, and the same question really applies to social scientists. We have an enormous amount of information, big data out there, vast quantities of it, but we're really not using it in the policy process. I'd like the panel maybe to, and that's also not been mentioned at all during our presentations, just how we make best use of the information that's out there, both on the social side and on the biophysical side, to develop good policy. Good. Panellists, um, let's, let's do a reverse order this time to save Meredith. If we start with Catherine, uh, mm -hmm. whatever you wanted to respond to from those questions. Well, I'll, as the, as the uh, question was addressed to me, I'll, I'll answer from the back or at least make some observations. I started uh, when I came to Canberra as a public servant before I uh, went to work in the press gallery. Uh, and that was in the early 90s. And uh, so in terms of your politicisation point, uh, I mean, I think the, the contract started, I think, pre-Howard. I think it started at the tail end of the Keating government. Uh, and uh, I, I very much remember uh, my departmental head saying to uh, the entire department that was assembled after there was a question time stuff up, uh, that, uh, that the department had one client and the client was the minister which was demonstrably untrue, but nonetheless it was about setting expectations in the department that there was, there was the king in the castle that needed to be served and that was our principal focus. So don't screw up the QTVs. Um, so, I mean, that's from my now ancient lived experience as a public servant. Uh, I agree with the general point. I think that that structural change where public servants, senior public servants are on contracts who have been sacked publicly through changes of government, that obviously alters the power balance between the bureaucracy and politics and probably not to the benefit of the public. Uh, but, it is, but it is sort of... It's certainly that, but it's more than that, in my view. Uh, I, I do think that time sequencing thing is a real issue. I don't know how you address it. I haven't got a clue how you address it, but I think that's part of the dynamic as well. Um, and I'm sure from a public service perspective, you must look at 
how things sort of go up into the sausage factory and come out the other side with a certain degree of bewilderment and incomprehension a lot of the time because, you know, there's sort of this big translation process that happens. But, look, I agree. I agree with what you're saying um, wholeheartedly. I don't think that that's helpful to the process of of senior public servants being able to defend their corner, being able to give frank and fearless advice, and for that culture to sort of permeate down in an apart into a department. Obviously, people are very risk averse now, very reactive, um, not inclined to speak up unless they're sort of lions of the public service who seem to operate on different rules than the rest. So anyway, that's just a couple of observations for what that's worth. John. Uh, yes, look, I, I think the politicisation of the public service was a major constraint on the development of good policy. And Howard's government was largely responsible for that. I did start a bit earlier. I mean, I was tagged by John Stone as a meretricious player back in the late 70s because I dare disagree with them. <laughs> and the world that I went into in the middle 70s was pretty much the legacy of the seven dwarfs and those uh, seven key public servants who operated from the Commonwealth Club over a port or whatever <laughs> and determined what government could or couldn't do. And, uh, you know, you're here for a short time, we're here for a long time. Uh, that transition to a fully public, pu politicised public service has been a you know, disarming process because it's gone, the pendulum's gone too far the other way. It's too far one way to start, too far the other way right now, and you need to think about how to do that. I thought the worst feature of the Howard government that nobody focused very much on, although some of us tried to run flat out on for weeks, was a simple change to the Cabinet documentation, a front page which allowed the Chief of Staff to say this submission was not read by the Minister. Didn't say the minister wasn't briefed about it, but he had not mm -hmm. read it. And that was a big thing, mm -hmm. I think, in the, in the mm -hmm. wheat board scandal and so on. But it's, it's a particular mm -hmm. issue. I think, uh, think think tanks are coming back, and they're very important. Mm -hmm. If you think back in years like Thatcher's time and so on, where they had an influence. And she used them, I guess, as a way of floating ideas as well as, as a, of them contributing substantively to debate. I think it is happening. Uh, there's still a bit of vested interest in some of those think tanks, which is uh, unfortunate. Uh, so it's not an objective assessment of the data. Everyone's got their own model these days, and surprisingly, the model seems to prove their particular point of view, uh, which is not an objective way of looking at the way those models should be built. Uh, on, on Twitter and, 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 uh, and Facebook and other things, I mean, I think we're still in our infancy in learning how to use them in politics. Uh, there's a lot of downside, and there's potentially a lot of upside. Um, some have used it quite well. I think Obama in his early years did use it very effectively. But now it's become a bit of a joke where you can run the US administration on the basis of an 140-character <coughs> tweet mm -hmm. and leave everyone to guess what you really meant. Um, so I think we're in our infancy on that. On data, I mean, there is a bit of a move on to try and amalgamate data, to, to put all these various agencies together. I know there was a big issue in the 80s about the Australia card and how dare we concentrate particular data that you could know everything about everybody, but realistically they probably do anyway. So, you know, the more you can put data sources together, social security data, tax data and so on, and underwrite better quality research, so I think the better we're going to get policy out of this. And um, it's a very painful process, to slowly, you know, learning by doing, but I think it's happening. Could I say, just before Meredith responds, the Social Sciences Academy has put forward a very strong and detailed proposal of how to consolidate That's social right. science databases to make much better use of big data for uh, human behavioural analysis. There's big data in a lot of the physical sciences. Uh, we want to emulate that in the social sciences and make that research infrastructure accessible, openly, helped by uh, staff who know the data to uh, work with social scientists in that area. Sorry to interrupt, Meredith. It's all right. Well, just on that one, I couldn't agree more. There is another place where public servants and others can join with academics and use this data. We need more transparency. We need more collaboration. Uh, on some of that megadata, the Commonwealth has to be pushed by the states mm. to release some of the data that they needed in order to help some of the uh, most difficult uh, client groups. Um, which they could do very well once they had the big data. But I remember hearing that and I thought, this is appalling. We're not collaborating at that level. But we need also to, to open it up for, for academics. I think think tanks have got a really important role to play as what I call knowledge brokers. They'll have their own value-based evidence, I call it, coming forward. 
Uh, we've got to see it for what it is. We know usually where they're coming from, but they often, researchers have done their work, but don't know how, we haven't talked much about communication. Politicians could do it better, but so could uh, academics. Yeah. And academics don't always want to do it. I mean, they want to do the research, but not necessarily all that uh, publicity um, or dissemination. And that's where I think think tanks can be really, really uh, valuable. With consultancies, I've got a bias because so many consultancy reports have hit, gone onto the desks of departments and they come back to us as researchers. Can you please check and verify mm -hmm. this? So that's sort of, you know, when we're not... We researchers are not seen as the front line, so to speak, when we could be, is something that I think um, we need to, to, to rethink through. By the way, we run an institute for governance that um, mm. does a lot of that trying to get the public servants and um, yeah, yeah, uh, researchers speaking together. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're both in that space trying to get closer relationships between, between the two. Um, I think you answered Peter Grant's question on uh, social media well. I, I think that it's, um, someone said recently, think about Keating and Howard, they probably would have gone to Twitter if it was in their era. I mean, they're savvy enough to want to do that, uh, I would have thought. So, um, who they knows, we don't know what... Hmm? They might have been paranoid too. <laughs> we don't know the counterfactual uh, there. I agree with you on what you said about tenure. I'll be interested in Dennis Richardson's views on all of that once, uh -huh. he's, yeah. once he uh, comes and talks to us in a forthright uh, manner. I think I've answered all the questions. Uh, we didn't answer this lady's question about engagement. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Right, yeah. uh, which yeah. I can pick up. Uh, you, your question was basically how do I become more involved or, or want to... How can I influence politics, right? Was that that's sort of the nub of it? Uh, well, um, by standing up and by, uh, by contacting your political representative and making your views known and taking opportunities. I mean, one of the, the great sort of wonderful, vibrant things about the current environment is how robust civil society is at this point in time and how energised civil society is. is. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the, the, there are a lot of people very disaffected with politics, some of whom are sitting back saying meh and some of whom are standing up. And, and organising and trying to make a difference. So, you know, I don't want to sound too Girl Scout, but I think that's the nub of it, that, that if you, you, you stand up and you look for opportunities to contribute and don't hesitate in terms of contacting local political representation and giving them a bollocking if, if you think, no, seriously, people don't do it enough. I mean, they, they, they are highly responsive. Politicians are highly responsive to the views of their community and their voters. And, and, uh, and people sit back as if they've got no power. Well, you do have power. You've got to vote. And you've also got the capacity to influence others. So, you know, do it, do it, do it. Get out there. Make the change in the world. You know, go <laughs> for it, I reckon. Just one more comment on social media too. Um, it's, uh, social media is, is um, uh, obviously has changed the way I work fundamentally, change the way politics is practised fundamentally and as John says we're still in our infancy, we're still working out how that all fits together and sifting the good and the bad of it. Um, I think politicians are increasingly looking to communicate with the public minus media filters. We've seen Pauline Hanson communicate almost exclusively via Facebook to her constituents rather than participating in a mainstream media interview. She sat down with Barry Cassidy in the week before the WA election campaign that didn't go so well. Um, so she communicates more or less exclusively to her constituency via social media. I thought it was very interesting with Turnbull's little economic and nationalist announcement yesterday that he went straight to Facebook with that rather than allow yes. the first take of that announcement to be framed by the inevitable critical media coverage which followed. So I think uh, politicians are looking increasingly to direct communication minus filter, which uh, a lot of people in the community would welcome because they don't like the media filter. But, you know, sometimes I would just say, by note of caution, beware of what you wish for. <laughs> OK. Um... I'll give you a last question, Pat, if you don't mind, but we're going to finish quickly. Uh, could I mention, first of all, though, just on the question of engagement, while uh, people are here, 
Uh, March 20, uh, April 22nd, I think it is, is the March for Science that is taking place around the country as something of a, dare I use the phrase, fight back for science reasserting the importance of scientific method, scientific approach, scientific support, uh, and social science regards itself as party to that, uh, that set of public initiatives that are taking place from science activists soon. I'm pretty sure it was April 22nd. Anyone Sunday. else here know? I think it's next Sunday. It's next, it's next, uh, next Saturday. Sunday. Next Sunday. Saturday. Saturday. Next Saturday. Saturday. Saturday here is... Uh, okay. okay. Saturday in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Pat, I wanted to get in the advertisement, though, for the engagement. Well, that's, uh, well, I just... Uh, 22nd. I want to make the comment that uh, one of the problems with the presentation and the way the problem has been defined is that it's far too narrow. Uh, what about the role of the researchers in this committee which are represented by the Academy of Social Sciences uh, and the role they have to play in a systematic way to try to raise the level of conversation and debate and understanding of the issues which might get some political focus or political definition at some point. But they don't start with that. So one of the one of the big changes that occurred in post-war Australian academia was um, the recognition of the work of Noel Butler, recognising that Australia was a nation that had, had been for a long time. So the whole attempt by him to change and to introduce a narrow definition of science was a real change. Well, I'm not sure that it's a narrow definition. I think it's a national discussion. The urbanisation process was incredibly effective um, and, and it had big policy implications when ultimately interpreted because the way it was done and it involved local government, state government, <coughs> politicians as well as the researchers across the way. So there was a conversation taking place when the articulation occurs, it's got much more chance of being politically effective. Uh, and, and the academy then has a responsibility in this debate. It's not, it's not something that is visited on us. We are part of it and we create it. Don't just wait for a handful of politicians or a handful of um, large physical and public relations areas, departments or private firms, to articulate and define the terms of debate, which is what has been happening for some time. And, and by the way, this is not something about just pro labor, because one of the greatest of the people who did that sort of stuff was Peter Nixon from Victoria, the way he took that on and tried to change the way we looked at investment in transport, for example, it was a major, a major, had a major impact, uh, and of course had a negative response um, from his own leader at the time. Nonetheless, it was there and it was underlying and made a big impact, and we need to go back to that, just that kind of well, let me be the one who answers that, if I could, it's a perfect note for the Academy to respond to. Uh, and indeed, uh, were we short of discussion tonight, I've got a list of about eight points of things I would want the Academy to be doing. Tonight is an example of an attempt by the Academy to contribute, but importantly, for instance, if you take that the Butlin, you know, Botany Bay Project example, the Council of Learned Academies these days is engaged on uh, 13 projects to date and another three or four coming that are multidisciplinary attempts to provide evidentiary bases for policy across crucial areas where holistic uh, solutions are very important and holistic evidence is very important. We took very seriously the, the uh, chastisement of people like Peter Shergold and Ian Watt and even Mike Keating about how about pulling disciplinary insight together because you come at us from all sorts of funny angles with your uh, specialised terminology, A, communicate more clearly, and B, communicate holistically. So we took that seriously, uh, and with some funding that Ian Chubb garnered from the Australian Research Council, we've produced a whole lot of Botany Bay-type projects and are continuing that now. That's areas like energy storage or precision medicine or uh, comparative advantage of Australia, uh, shortages of scientists and technologists and so on. So we are taking that lesson across the academies, which I think uh, it used to be when I first was involved in, in the Academy of Social Sciences, we just fought each other all the time and tried to grab a share of the, the small amount of money available and spent a lot of time sort of deciding who was you know, higher in the pecking order than the other or whatever. 
now there's been a remarkable ability to work together, which I'm finding uh, very um, a source of optimism for how we in the academy can take ourselves forward a bit better. And if a number of the incentive structures are changed to get us to engage and not just do international excellent research, but do excellent engagement and impact as well uh, and communicate it well, then we do have a chance of, of contributing better than I think we have in the past. And that comes back to what are those incentives, what are the policies that would deliver on that and the like. But let me just... Um, I haven't got time to go through my long list of you know, my, my academic fight back list here, but uh, let me say small things like the Academy of Social Sciences website now has a provision where any media person can go in, it's not highlighted enough, which is another thing we've still got to do, and find out what the specialties are uh, for areas of interest of all the academics, not just their names, uh, but what their specialties are by. Are you interested in immigration? Are you interested in public health? Are you interested in indigenous uh, poverty? And you can find who the experts are and contact them for follow-up to get and tap the academy. You can do that already for every individual university, but if you want to do it for all academies and all issues and all universities and all associated researchers, non-university researchers who are fellows, the academies are themselves now making their expertise uh, more accessible for those who wish to put their name forward and for those who wish to access them. Uh, a whole lot of things like that we could be doing, but I think we're running out of time. Uh, we are trying to think along these lines, <coughs> as you suggest, Pat. But thank you all for contributing, participating tonight. Could we uh, thank the panel and also thank the Academy staff who've been supporting us through the organisation and delivery of this.